Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Ask Valor Masterminds podcast. I'm Galen. I'm Joe. And we're coming at you from the BD Local Studios in Tacoma, Washington. This podcast is brought to you by CR Gutters and A Advanced Septic Services. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the show. Thank you. All right, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the Ask Valor Masterminds podcast. My name is Galen. I'm Joe. And we are coming at you virtually from the BD Local Studios in Tacoma, Washington, but this is the stay home, social distancing quarantine version. So I'm at home, Joe's at home. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by A Advanced Septic Services and CR Gutters. So thank you all for tuning in. So Joe, for our new listeners and viewers, why don't you tell everyone how the Ask Valor Masterminds podcast came to be? Sure. So Ask Valor Masterminds originally started as a Facebook group page, which is still live. Uh, it was private, now it's public, but we just wanted to bring businesses together to share tips uh, and um, advice on how to run a business and anything that has to do with owning a business. Uh, and because of that, um, we decided that we wanted to uh, start a podcast which is obviously called Ask Bella Masterminds, and just bring on different guest speakers uh, to bring on topics all related to everything related to business. Uh, we've had on networking, we've had on biohacking, we've had on um, things about video content, social media, uh, and then we also do spotlights with local businesses uh, in the communities here in Washington. And so today that's what we're gonna do. Awesome. So last week we were so blessed to have Dr. Ivan Meisner, the founder, Chief Visionary Officer of VNI. So last week, Joe, what was one of your big takeaways from when uh, Ivan was on with us? Well, there were a lot of takeaways, but the one that stuck out is his 24-7-30 follow-up method. So what that means is within 24 hours uh, to follow up with an email or send a card, um, and then within seven days, connect on LinkedIn and social media. Uh, followed by within 30 days, reach out to schedule a one-to-one. -one. And then the biggest thing of all of it really has to do with not trying to sell someone. So when you're out there networking and you meet someone that you want to connect with, uh, I know that everyone wants to sell, but within this first 30, 60 days, it's, it's not the goal to sell. It's just really to get to know them uh, as a person and their business and always ask them, you know, uh, what can I do for you? Right. So relationships are key. And we both believe in that. Our company's kind of motto is being really transparent with customers and everything. So, so great. So feel free to check us out on our Ask Valor Masterminds website or YouTube channel. So today, as Joe mentioned, uh, we are doing a local spotlight. So in terms of everything going on now, um, we wanted to try just to be as positive as possible. So what better way to showcase a local business, and especially during times like these, even pivoting to help with the needs of the community. So Justin Stiefel of Heritage Distilling, the co-founder and CEO should be joining us um, really shortly. So before he comes on, um, and Sadie, can you cue the image for the uh, stay in place sour? It's actually on his blog, on the Heritage Distilling's blog, there's a a cocktail drink that I made with BSB, brown sugar bourbon. So cheers to Justin for coming on. Um, so we wanted to start today with our A Advanced Septic quote of the day. Justin, thanks for jumping on again, and then we'll formally introduce you. Thanks so for having me. that image. In the midst of chaos, there is also opportunity. So this quote was by Sun Tzu a Chinese general military strategist. He was often credited for uh, the author of The Art of War, so a more military strategy. But uh, during these difficult times, giving us the opportunity to look inward, reflect on what truly matters and connect with ourselves and our loved ones on a deeper level. So not even thinking about business, but for business, definitely we're thinking about that. So um, I know that alcohol sales are up, Right, uh, that's an essential thing. I, I went to Total Wine and picked up uh, whiskey on uh, World Whiskey Day, you know, last week and everything. So Justin, we wanted to go over a couple alcohol trends and just kind of get your feedback. I know it's a serious time, yep. people are hurting and everything, but um, hey, 
cheers to make it better. So thank you. Well, I appreciate the shout out. I appreciate the opportunity to be. I, uh, <clears throat> I attended classes at the Naval War College when I was back in DC, and, and one of the uh, one of the semesters we actually studied Sun Tzu in the Art of War, and, um, and uh, uh, one of my favorite quotes from him: is, uh, "Quickness is the essence of war." So the pivot we made is a to respond on the market on a couple. Of weeks. I think demonstrates uh, um, how to have that kind of approach to and uh, in terms of trends uh, we saw a week ago the data from Nielsen said spirits were up seven percent spirit sales at retail uh, beer and wine were up in the very digits spirits continues to lead the path of growth um, the shelter in place, uh, the result from shelter in place was that you had a lot of people go into grocery stores and we saw this in the news and they're buying whatever they found on the shelves, whether it was toilet paper, paper towels, butter, and booze. And uh, because there's uncertainty and, and there's DSB, yep. And with uncertainty, uh, you know, people don't like uncertainty. And so they, they want to... Uh, know that they've got some kind of sense of security, especially if, if they're being told they have to stay home. The opposite is happening on premise. We call bars and restaurants the on-premise trade. That's where people go to consume on premise. With the shelter in place and the shutdown of those services, it essentially brought beer, wine, and spirit sales to a screeching halt. One of the things many states did in response to that is they allowed the beer, uh, the bars and restaurants to begin to sell beer, wine, and cocktails to go as long as people are buying food. That's only happened in a few states like Louisiana and uh, Nevada. But now here in Washington, all of a sudden, my wife and I last week, we went to, we ordered takeout from a Mexican restaurant. We ordered two margaritas. The margarita came uh, packaged in a cup with ice. And then the liquor was in two little mini airplane sized bottles. Oh, nice. Sealed, <laughs> ready to go. So we took it home and we mixed it. So one of the questions that's going to come out of this is, when the legislature convenes next year in Olympia, are the bars and restaurants going to go and say, hey, we want this to be a permanent offering because we've demonstrated we can do this responsibly and it's another way to generate revenue. And what will the reaction to that be? Because I, I, I think that genie cannot be put back in the bottle. You're seeing the same thing happen nationally. And uh, that's just one of the trends. Um, the, the bigger trend we've been seeing more globally in the last year is this move to canned cocktails, um, to uh, things like Truly and White Claw, right. which are really a beer. Those are, are beers that have been made uh, to have no flavor at all. They've been filtered to be clear. They usually are less than 5% alcohol. And then they'll add carbonation. <clears throat> and they'll add another flavoring element to make it like um, grapefruit or whatever. And to be as low calorie as possible. So uh, that trend is not going away. It demonstrates that the consumers are wanting things that are lower calorie, lower sugar, and, and things that they perceive to be healthier and clean, even though uh, you know, there are some who would say that there is no healthy amount of alcohol. Um, so those are really the top trends globally. But right now, the trend is buy bottles of beer, wine, and spirits, buy cases of it, take it home, because nobody knows when this shelter in place is going to be lifted. That's what we're seeing. Awesome. So we're going to go over a couple of trends I found, and just. You've uh, mentioned it, but um, we'll, we'll kind of go over a couple and just get a quick thought. So you mentioned, so cocktails in a can, cue that image, cocktails in a can. So ready RTD, ready to drink beverages. So I see White Claw, you know, mul you know the younger generation, since I'm in my late 40s, uh, blowing that stuff up and everything. Yep. See commercials like Truly and everything. Yep. Um, you know, I could see it. So you've already mentioned that. Um, the next trend is gin, so like a ginnasant. So, what I'd sent to you is old becomes new, since it's like a like a botanical. And I think you have other, you, your gins have been widely awarded. And then you even mentioned. I think the last time I stopped in your taste room, there's like a aquavie that you you guys yep. created some other botanical stuff. So talk yep. about that trend real quick with the botanical sure. spirits. What we're seeing, um, in, so gin requires typically no aging. Um, there are some old, very old recipes where the gin required some aging, but the, the contemporary consumer right now does not expect their gin to be aged. Uh, to make gin is uh, another process after you make the base for vodka. 
And so it becomes a process that's fairly uh, consistently easy to do for distilleries as long as they've got the recipe nailed down. One of the things consumers really like is consistency. And so uh, gin is very particular for consumers. There, there are lots of gins on the market. Uh, and if you have a flavor of gin that you like, it's because the botanical mix in that gin from that distiller is very specific. And uh, in many cases, the distillers don't tell you the full array of botanicals that they include, so you don't really know. So if you find a gin you like, I encourage you to continue to enjoy that gin. You may experiment with some others that are out there. We're not seeing gin as a category increase in volume. What we're seeing is a move to optimization. So we're seeing people elevate into more craft styles of gin and to more expensive gins as opposed to the volume of gin growing in demand it's still about five percent of spirits in, in the u.s for consumption uh of course in the uk gin is just exploded as the number of distilleries now in the uk uh grow and that makes sense because it uh, was a product born in the uk out of necessity about 150 200 years ago Awesome. Hey, Joe, real quick. Uh, what is your preferred spirit? What do you like drinking, Joe? Uh, if it comes to it, I'm usually a beer guy, but um, I like seven and sevens and whiskey sours. Nice. Well, here's we, a... We say the beer is what the, what whiskey wants to be when I'm just to make whiskey. You technically <laughs> need to start with the beer and you put the beer through a still the whiskey and then you age it. So... Uh, uh, it, here's, it, it, here's to the first, first step of whiskey. Right. And then... Uh, with the beers, I'm usually a pretty simple guy. I stick to just something that most people don't drink anymore, which is PBR. PBR pounders. There you yep. go. So okay. to our next. Real quick on the, real oh, quick on the PBR side, you know, PBR came out with a canned uh, uh, alcohol with coffee in the oh. can. And uh, they just announced one, uh, a, a peach flavored uh, hard tea in the can, all from PBR. So. Nice. There you go, Joe. Some, they know they're they know you're out there. Yep. So, QR <laughs> next image. So, uh, brown spirits booming. So I'm a brown spirit guy. You know, I'm a whiskey bourbon guy. BSBs always on my shelf. Um, so you guys have been what one of the most awarded craft spirit distillers. So what's your thought on brown spirits? It means a lot to me because I'm a consumer of it. Justin, your thoughts? Well, uh, brown spirits are growing. They continue to grow rapidly. It, it's one of the fastest growing elements of the spirits segment. The flavored whiskey category alone is, is growing among the fastest of all uh, spirits categories. It's up there with tequila in terms of growth. Um, so many distilleries in the U.S. now, about 2,000, and they're all experimenting to try to grab consumer attention and to generate revenue. Uh, BSB is our number one seller by far. We have a national distribution of BSB brown sugar bourbon, um, both the 60 proof and the 103 proof version. We're seeing very much in that result of that. And, uh, you know, Galen, I've known you now for several years. And <clears throat> when, when you and I first met, I told you, uh, I, and I still maintain this idea today that in every state or every region, there is going to be a, an opportunity for a brand to emerge, to be a super regional or a national brand. And I told you when I first met you, I yep. want Heritage Distillery, to Heritage Distilling Company, to be that brand that emerges as the spirit of choice or the the supplier of choice out of the Northwest to go national. And BSB was was the product that that did that for us. Uh, if you see growth now in the broader whiskey category, we're seeing a big trend to single malts, American style single malts, what you might normally consider to be scotch coming from Scotland. Mm -hmm. Can't call it that here, but there's a, a huge push for single malt American style whiskeys. Uh, we are experimenting with some unmalted whiskeys, uh, just straight barley from the farm with no malting and the flavor profile is amazing on that. Um, you're also seeing a shift in, in demographic of who's consuming the whiskey. We're seeing women entering the whiskey space at a torrid pace. Um, they want to get into the whiskeys. And the way you know it's happening is by watching TV shows and movies. Ten years ago, if you were watching a show with a female cast who are doctors or lawyers or whatever, and, and in the show they're going to the bar, they were ordering a white wine. Now you watch those shows and the women are ordering whiskey 
they're ordering bourbon, they're ordering it neat, they're order, ordering on the rocks. So the writers of these shows typically have uh, tapped into the zeitgeist that's out there. They see right. what's going on, right? And so they're incorporating that in the storyline. That is proof that there's an underlying move. And we see the data. The data says that women consuming whiskey uh, has more than doubled in the last 10 years in the U.S. And the trend is growing rapidly. Yeah, I see that too with some of the shows I follow. Like uh, the show Billions on HBO. Yep. You know, that yep. has a lot of brown spirits. Uh, yep. Even like, well, this isn't really for women, but like John Wick, you know, yep. like he has his stuff. And then I just see it as a, as a fan. So yep. we'll, we'll come back to that later. So yep. next image is... Cocktails shine bright on Instagram. So Justin, you mentioned this and I see it on YouTube too, but a lot of craft, you know, I'm an amateur, I'm a dad and I like to play bartender at home. I follow people on Instagram or YouTube and you guys' Instagram page is just has a lot of different ideas. And I like the way that the brand kind of engages with people. So, um, you know, you have influencers and followers and, BSB has made its way kind of mainstream with that. So um, have, have you guys allowed the public to determine the narrative for like, you know, what you guys do on social and Instagram, or is it you guys controlling that? Well, you know, on, on Instagram specifically, there are, um, we have a, a uh, loyal base of fans that will post their own image of themselves with bottles of their own cocktails. Certainly, we encourage that. We we want people to do it responsibly. We want them, our brand is associated with responsible activities and uh, twenty one year old and not uh, encouraging overconsumption. Mm -hmm. um, works very hard to create the visual effect. You know, part of of uh, what attracts people in social media now is the visual appearance, whether it's short videos or beautiful images, and uh, you want your cocktail to be Grammable, you know, Instagrammable, you want it to catch attention, you want shares and so on. Uh, we focus on that. We also focus on trying to make sure that if, you know, you yourself are an amateur uh, cocktail guy, you shouldn't have to have a PhD to make a good cocktail. And part of the approach that we uh, have tried to create and create the spirits is to make the spirits as easily mixable as possible with one or two items. You don't need 14 steps. You don't need to be um, uh, using a bunch of equipment. You don't need a bunch of ingredients. The typical consumer, uh, the data shows us that when they have spirits, it's a one-to-one -one mix. They mix a spirit with one other item, maybe two. And if you're hosting a party, you don't want to be um, uh, overcomplicating things. And you want it to be something you can do with, at scale. So we try to do that, give you ideas on how to, how to make um, batch cocktails for parties you may be having and how to make individual cocktails at home in one or two very easy steps that taste great all the time, consistently easy, and that you can impress your friends and they don't need to know how it was for you to do it because, you know, why show the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain? Well, cheers to that. So Yeah, and I appreciate that for that cocktail, you use the actual authentic Luxardo cherry out of... Uh, oh, it, yeah, that so that's the, the nerd, that's the nerd in me where it's not just any... Marciano cherry, get the oh, no. stuff, right? It's got to be authentic. Yeah, yeah. Makes and the juice, is, the juice is equally as important as the cherry itself uh, out of that Luxardo jar. Yes, sir. So cue our, our last image for our CR Gutters Did You Know segment. So alcohol delivery rising. So yeah. we have it with Amazon Fresh. You can go to Safeway and order stuff. Um, when I went to Total Wine last week, I had to put my order in online and then I went in the store to make sure no one was near me and pick it up. But um, even on your website, I see that delivery is available. Uh, Justin, can you talk about alcohol delivery in this upcoming year? Sure. So if you look at the, just a COVID hit with the, the shelter uh, in place uh, order, Drizzly's sales have gone up dramatically. It's probably the online platform. With Drizzly, they partner with local retail stores and liquor stores around the country by market. When you enter your uh, zip code or address and you order the product, we'll find the local, the closest liquor store that participates with them. Uh, the transaction is run through this, and then Drizzly goes and picks it up and delivers it to your house for a fee. <clears throat> there are others that will do the same thing. In part, you know, you can go to 
on it, and they'll buy the alcohol for you. Um, I, I think you're going to start to see Postmates and Uber Eats, these other delivery areas begin to move into the alcohol space, especially now that the restaurants are being allowed to package up beer, wine, and spirits to go with food. You know, so why would Uber Eats and Postmates and those guys, uh, why would they not allow that to be added to the regular food? Uh, this is part of the ever-changing desire of the customer for convenience. And again, that needs to go back in the box. It's legal here in Washington. I went in 2015, a lobby the legislature. We drafted a bill. We got an act to allow us to ship spirits to the home in Washington and to deliver and uh, to deliver co to consumers. So when we hit, we started to do that. We're delivering not just our hand sanitizer, but spirits to people at home. Awesome. So just transitioning on that. So you guys, uh, I saw the press release. You guys pivoted your production to do hand sanitizer, which is really yep. cool, you know, doing your part. And actually, uh, um, cue the image of the Mark Cuban tweet. So Mark Cuban, famous for Shark Tank, owner of the Dallas Mavericks, right? Serial entrepreneur. Um, so proud of my guys at Brown Sugar Bourbon for, for you guys making hand sanitizer. So um, this is the time where we give our public service announcement to always wash your hands 20 seconds, you know, yep. for our yep. coronavirus. But uh, um, what made you pivot to hand sanitizer? Was it uh, like, the Washington distilleries coming together? Was it uh, an internal decision? Talk to us about how COVID-19 affected you guys. Yeah, so, you know, when, when when the whole thing started to come down now, well, first off, January 21st, I got to go back to January 21st. Uh, the first case of COVID in the U.S. was in Washington, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And um, so that day, I came to our um, production team. I said, look, in China in November, early parts of January, where everything was just shut down. down. I said, I think things are going here. And so we have probably a six week lead time to make as much BSB as possible to fill the warehouse because we don't know if there's going to be supply chain interruptions. We don't know if going to be stay at home orders or shut down. These other things, we had no, no idea team did it. We added extra shifts, we worked on weekends, six weeks, we filled the warehouse. So we had three and a half to four months worth of BSB in the warehouse, ready to go in cases and bottles ready for shipment. So then uh, that same, when we finished that task, all of the stuff started to hit here in, in the area. And all of a sudden the bars were ordered to, to close down, the home state the shelter orders were, uh, you could tell the unemployment was going to uh, take off. We had very difficult decisions. We laid off about 60 people because we couldn't sell. You know, we, we the sales team can't go out making sales calls. <clears throat> There's no one taking those meetings. It's a restaurant and selling alcohol. Um, our production team, we didn't know what was going to go on. So, and then our retail, they limited, restricted what you could do for retail until deliveries became essential again to be able to open up. So after the layoffs, um, been getting pinged online, but as we're making, very small quantities of hand sanitizer in our waste product. And so we were being asked, hey, when are you going to make hand sanitizer? So we convened our team the next morning and said, hey, we have the equipment. We're one of the biggest in, in the Northwest. Let's ramp up and do it on a massive scale. Uh, we can't do it for because while the other are getting rid of their waste product, which is, is something to get rid of anyway, we're, we're going to take our good alcohol that normally would go into vodka or into gin, and we're going to move it into a hand sanitizer have to charge for that. We'll make some donations. Um, and we went to our partners at the Shahalas Indian tribe uh, for uh, a project we've been working on for four years. It's going to open in July. And I said, Hey, there's a lot of tanks there. There's about 80,000 gallons of tank space for the fermenters, just on the distillery side of that project. It's going to be a massive distillery of one of the biggest craft distilleries west of the Mississippi river when it opens later on the summer. I said, let's, Let's ramp up now. Let's rework some piping and let's start making 25 to 30,000 gallons a day. Of so they agreed. And we spent the last two weeks retrofitting tanks and venting and some safety protocols. And by Monday coming up on April 13th, we are ready to start doing massive batches of hand sanitizer in bulk. And we already have POs with some of the biggest uh, names you can imagine, grocery stores, retailers, 
uh, airline or airplane production, it's uh, big shoe manufacturers, uh, anybody that has operations ongoing, they want to protect their staff. We also have orders from the biggest healthcare organizations coast, and now we're getting orders from uh, state and federal government as well. So uh, it allowed us to put our team back to work. It'll to actually expand hours, bring some additional power. We're going to be adding more people on the production side than what we originally had. Uh, we've been selling out every day online and in our tasting room at all of our retail locations. Um, the response from the community is amazing. Uh, the response from our team has been has been phenomenal. They are added. They're focused. They understand that that we're one of the rare companies that can uh, that has been able to pivot effectively. And uh, I'm just very proud of how the team has handled it. And, you know, I, I uh, was reviewed by the South Sound business maker and I said, um, you know, companies cannot be by what they thought their business was a month ago. If you want to survive this thing, you've got to step back, examine, have the equipment, the resources, people, the talent in this, case, and how are you going to rethink yourself move forward right now in a way that is aggressive yet responsible, you can emerge as a surviving company in the back. And if you can do that, those companies will be stronger uh, as we go to rebuild the economy because there is going to be some lingering damage economically based on, on just what we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's awesome. I know you guys' slogan is every spirit has a story. And what yeah. a great story for your uh, hand sanitizer pivot right there. I mean, you just encapsulated it right there of I applaud you for uh, doing that. So um, we have a few minutes left. We definitely would, would like to have you on again, but sure. we want to get to know you, Justin, the individual. So um, cue Justin's image. So your wife and you founded Heritage Distilling. Um, you know, you're a graduate of the University of Idaho, right? Uh, yeah. an, entre entre an, an attorney by trade, an entrepreneur at heart, and you guys, form this great company, but we want to get to know Justin a little bit. So Joe, why don't you ask the first question to Justin? Sure. So um, being that it's a marketing podcast and you've already mentioned what you're doing marketing wise, but um, what lessons, give us like one or two lessons you learned as an early entrepreneur. Uh, don't be afraid to think big. Uh, don't be afraid to take risks. Most people don't take risks. Um, the risk should be calculated. Uh, you should have uh, an educated guess. You can't be silly about it. Um, uh, show up. 80% of life is showing up. A lot of people don't. Uh, most importantly, if you're dealing with customers, I, I tell all the time, the customer has so many choices now that when they, they get out of bed, they uh, get in a car, ride the, on their bike, take the bus or they go online and they come to your store or they come to your, your virtual storefront, they've done 90% of the work. It's your job to do the last 10% to meet them in the middle, to give them amazing customer service, make sure they're treated fairly um, and uh, respect the fact that they came to you as opposed to a competitor. And then I, I remind people all the time when it comes to uh, what you do for a service or an offering, the consumer never lies. Individual customers, they will lie all the time. You'll get an individual customer who, who lies about they had a defective product or it was cheaper somewhere else, or that kind of stuff. The consumer as a whole, as a buying entity, never lies because the consumer ultimately decides what products are going to win and what products are going to lose. And you have to understand that. You can't fall in love with your own product. You have to understand that what's most important is that the consumer adopts it. Otherwise, you're dead. Awesome. So next question is, what's the best piece of advice that you've been given? Uh, best piece of advice that I've been given is uh, oh, probably just trust your gut. You know, trust your gut. Your gut will, will more often than not um, uh, give you an indication of what goes on. And, and uh, I think uh, the book Blink probably sums it up pretty well. Nice. And what a last question is, why is marketing your business so important? People are inundated with stuff all the time, every day. Um, there are more and more ways where uh, products, goods, or services are being thrown at them, literally thrown at them, whether it's a poster on a bus stop, it's junk email, it's pop-up ads, it's radio, it's TV, it's the whole thing. So <clears throat> you have to figure out how to cut through that 
if you're not marketing, no one knows you're there. Um, and if you are going to market, you've got to make sure you can cut through the garbage and uh, have your voice be heard. Sometimes your audience is an audience of one, literally. There are times where we'll put together an ad campaign because uh, strategically we want to target a single decision maker at a major company whose job it is is to find products and buy those products. Sometimes you, we are marketing to the masses and uh, you've got to understand the G and the tech required to achieve a specific goal that you have. Have you awesome. found, have you found one last question that came up? What has, what have you found to be the best form of marketing? Uh, I don't know that there is a best form of marketing because each marketing outlet is designed to deliver a certain message or to hit a certain demographic or consumer. So um, but certainly there are some that, will uh, claim them, but the data you got to just look at the data and then prove whether or not it makes sense so awesome. last question before we wrap up again justin um again i just want to thank you for uh coming on and speaking to our listeners and viewers uh online um definitely a great success story we'd love to have you on again but my last two exiting questions would be um what is it you're most proud of for Heritage Distilling, and what can people look forward to this to this upcoming year? You know, as we kind of go into the rebound of uh, getting back to normalcy and everything, um, those two questions for you. Well, so uh, I'll take the last one. What can people look for this year? They can look to our new facility in Tumwater, Washington, in conjunction with South Puget Sound Community College. It's a project we've been working on for three years with the state of Washington and the community college. Is that the Talking school. Cedar project? No. No, nope, it's is, something else? Uh, okay. This is, this is something else. This is called the Craft District. It's in Tumwater. It's right across the river from the old Olympia Brewing um, facility. And uh, state-of-the-art heritage company with Big Cass Club. There's an amphitheater, so we're, we're creating a destination for the South Sound. It's going to be breweries and winery tasting rooms, the whole thing. South Puget Sound Community College shares the building with us. They've got a whole brewing and distilling where students go in and they learn all aspects, whether it's marketing, production, QA, finance, whatever it is, they want to start their own brewery to still work with us on our equipment. And for us, it's going to be a great workforce development program it's going to open up later on this year. Uh, and uh, then the big one is Talking Cedar. It's the Heritage Distilling Company at Talking Cedar with the Chehalis Indian Tribe. Uh, 3,000 square foot facility. It's about a $25 million project. <coughs> Massive distillery. Branded as Heritage and Heritage Products uh, in partnership with us. They have their own Talking Cedar Brewery, uh, the brewery there. There'll be a bar and a restaurant. Again, it's going to be one of the largest craft distilleries west of the Mississippi River. It'll be probably in the top four or five breweries in Washington by capacity on the day it opens with the, the beer equipment they have. Um, very proud and of that, that and that's located in that's in Grand Mound, Washington. Grand Mound, it's literally a couple blocks away from the uh, Great Wolf Lodge. It's right so when up I, on. So when I go with my kids, yeah. I have an adult place, not the casino, to go enjoy yeah. a beverage. Right. <laughs> that's right. This literally is at exit uh, eighty-eight, and it is uh, right off the exit when you pull off and you go to the Starbucks or, or the McDonald's there on Highway 12 and I-5. I mean, they could not have picked a better place. The tribe is an amazing partner. They're very, they're visionary, they're forward thinking, not afraid to take risk. Um, we have, a, and, and we're developing this model to go nationwide with additional tribes. Um, and this is, this is blow people's mind when they walk in, they see the, the side that we designed the custom in, in Italy, uh, massive columns, eight, eight uh, columns, two massive pot stills and the very unique shared column design. Um, we went to Red Brewery, uh, the old bill when they were auctioning off, we bought a bunch of those old fermentation tanks and repurposed them. When people walk in, the eye candy alone, the visual intoxication is just going to knock people's socks off. It's going to be an amazing destination. Will there be a cigar bar there by any chance? Uh, no, I don't think oh. so. I don't think so. We, we actually don't really want smoking in a distillery because, you know, the vapors tend to be somewhat explosive. So, uh, we try to Selfish question. Sorry. Try to, I understand. I understand. Uh, and then your first question, what am I most proud of? I'm, I'm really most proud of uh, the culture that we've been able to develop and, and retain at the company that is customer focused and employee focused. Uh, I get comments all the time from customers raving about the customer service they get with our employees. 
And I think that starts at the top. I think it also starts uh, with the people who are on our executive team because we treat everybody fairly. Everybody uh, is asked their opinion, they're uh, provided input. We love ideas. One of the things I try to teach my staff is if you come in with an idea, uh, I want to I want to know about the kernel of the idea, but then want to know how we can make it bigger, how we can make it better, how we can scale. And uh, with that, uh, you you really begin to see the thought process develop in the employees on how to think about the business as a whole and how they fit into the business. And I'm just very proud, not just recently, the pivot and everything that the staff has done on the hand sanitizer and how they're interacting with the public, but just in general. And I think that customer service element. Uh, is an indication of uh, the core values of, that the company has because it is so forward facing to the customer. Awesome. Thanks. Well, thank you again for joining us. Um, we appreciate it. I think in times like this, any kind of positivity we want to share proactively to our community. So uh, perhaps we'll reach out to you again. And then if I run out, I'll restock or maybe try the <laughs> 103 version. But uh, Justin, thanks uh, from my from myself, from Joe, we're signing off from the BD Local Studios virtually in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, thank you for watching the Ask Valor Masterminds podcast. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. People can go to heritagedistilling.com and we'll get them set up. Nice. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. And I